a way to give you things to maybe set yourself up for success in a year. You know, we had Kenny Linder talking about emotional and how to get control of your emotions and act uh, how you act under pressure and what the consequences are for your actions. Have other people like Kevin, uh, uh, Kevin McCrudden came out. He was the inventor of uh, Motivational Day, National Motivational Day on January 2nd. He talked about how to set your goals and actually achieve those goals. And now joining us in studio, Colonel Lee Ellis, a former Vietnam POW, served this country for years. His new book is called Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Yes, he was was kept uh, uh, he was captive uh, during the Vietnam War pieces of it and he was there when John McCain was there who actually is uh, written the forward to the book Colonel welcome thanks Brian good to be with you Colonel how do you learn from captivity I think we learn from every challenge and hardship we face in fact we learn better under the trials than we do under the successes so we had a lot of time to reflect we had some difficult situations to contend with and the, so many lessons. One, first of all, to really know yourself. A lot of time to reflect on yourself, what's, what you've done well and what you haven't done so well. Uh, I realized I hadn't been a good student in school. I kind of cruised through. But uh, after that, I became a very good student. So I think just coming to grips with the realities of uh, the world when you're a young man. Bring us back to the 24-year-old uh, mm-hmm. that was shot down. Yes, I was on my 53rd combat mission over North Vietnam. Uh, I felt I was pretty experienced. I'd been hit before. My airplane had been hit before, but that day it blew up, and uh, fortunately, we were able to eject out of the airplane immediately. We? Uh, two of us in the airplane. It's a two-place airplane, the F-4 Phantom fighter bomber. So you get blown up, and where did you find yourself on the ground? I was coming down right around the gunners in, over enemy territory, and uh, there was a lot of shooting going on, shooting at our wingman, maybe shooting at us, I don't know, coming down the parachute. But uh, the militia surrounded me right after I hit the ground. My buddy, Ken Fisher, they actually caught him in his parachute. He never did his parachute landing fall. Wow, they, they never let him hit the ground. Never let him hit the ground. So w- is there any way to, to, um, uh, to match that terror you must have felt as you know you're about to be uh, taken prisoner? You know, I didn't feel terror. I was doing my job. I was doing what I was trained to do when I ejected, when I was right. coming down in a parachute. Uh, I didn't feel terror at that point. It was only after they captured me and they stripped me down to my undershorts that the the trauma really hit, the terror hit then. And when did it start? Uh, when did the trauma start? When the, When they actually took away my flight suit and my boots, and then I realized I was out of control. Yeah. Uh, and did the physical and mental torture uh, start right away? No, uh, they didn't know. They were just kind of soldiers, and they were doing the job of bringing in pilots alive to Hanoi. So it took me two weeks to get to Hanoi. And during that time, I was bombed and strafed three times by American air power, and three times the local populace tried to kill me. The local Communist Party cadre used a bullhorn, got them all fired up, and then it was like one of the old movies where there's going to be a riot to get somebody and lynch them, and they were coming after me. And amazingly, the militia that captured me were pretty good soldiers. They took their job seriously. They were told to bring pilots in alive, and they protected me and took me to Hanoi. And when you got to Hanoi, what were the conditions like? Uh, well, the Hanoi Hilton is uh, was our name, dark humor, gallows humor, for Wallow Prison. It's a fortress in downtown Hanoi that occupies a whole block. French prison built in the early 1900s. Walls are 15 feet high, 5 feet thick. Uh, and then the walls between cells are 16 inches thick. My particular cell was 6 and a half by 7 feet. No common wall with any other wall. Very cold in the winter. Meager food. Uh, soup twice a day and a piece of bread or a cup of rice. So, mm-hmm. And the threats became every, every cell had a speaker in it. So it had, uh, like the camp radio, it was like an intercom system. And they played propaganda three times a day and threatened us with war crimes trials and torture and everything else. And then, sure enough, uh, the interrogation started and then it happened. How did, how did they go about getting what they wanted from you? Uh, with me, they wanted me to fill out a three-page biography, which I refused. I filled out name, rank, service number, date of birth, the big four, we call it. And uh, when I refused after that, they did the good cop, bad cop routine with me. And then when I still didn't comply, they began what we call the humane torture, put you in a position of stress. And when you quit torturing yourself, then they came in and started kicking and beating on me. So I went through several cycles of 
uh, on my knees on the concrete floor with my hands over my head, handcuffed together. My feet are in leg irons. My legs are in leg irons. And, uh, you know, after a few hours of that, I'd lay back down or sit back down, roll over, and uh, the guards would come in and start you know, kicking, beating me. They put guards on me just to keep me up all the time. And eventually I said, I've got to find a second line of resistance. This is not going to work forever. So, And what was it? Uh, I agreed to do what they wanted me to do. Of course, when I filled in was all lies. You know, the only thing I, that was truthful in that uh, biography was the name of my father and the town that was the nearest town to where we lived on the farm. I didn't actually give our address. I just put the post office. I knew I knew the postman and all the people in the post office there. So I knew they'd take care of it. Right. And they did. And so you going through this process, how long did it last? Uh, what process? Your imprisonment. Oh, five and a half years. I went down 11 days after John McCain and, McCain and came on, on the same flight. And when did you first, did you, did you go out to interact with him? I did. Uh, we were in the same camp several times, but we didn't see each other. And then at the end of the war, uh, in January, when the peace agreements were signed, we both moved into the same camp, one we called the Plantation, which was there in Hanoi. And they grouped us by shoot-down and capture date so that they could release us by shoot-down and capture date. And then I saw him every day. We walked together in the compound. He had a bad limp, of course, his arms. He was probably the worst uh, injured of all the POWs who came home. And most of those injuries uh, did not happen on the crash, right? Well, a lot of them did because he was in a, a asymmetrical condition rolling when he went out of the airplane and broke his arms coming out of the airplane and his leg. But then they beat him with rifle butts and stabbed him a couple of times with their bayonets, too, when he was captured. And it was not, uh, it was not healed the right way. The name of the book is Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, Lee Ellis is here. So, Colonel, relay some of those lessons for us now. Some of the things that you mm -hmm. pick up in those horrific situations are? Yeah, first of all, know yourself. Know what your passion is. What are you really passionate about? Uh, what's your personality style? You know, uh, mine, I'm very uh, aggressive and adventurous, so sitting behind a desk was not an option for me at that point in my life. Flying was right at home. And your purpose. And I felt very purposeful in being in the military. I felt like that's where I should be. Uh, and then your values. When you know those things, then you try, you have something to work toward living true to those, which helps you to be authentic. And you, uh, you talk about working on your character, too. Yes. Guard your character. Everybody wants to assume they have good character, but in reality, unless you're conscious about clarifying what are the values you really stand for and what are you willing to stand up for and how much are you willing to how far are you willing to go that's so important and the other part of that character piece is you got to have a team around you people that you can go to and say here's the situation I'm facing this is what I'm considering does this does this sound okay are you telling me that you develop these traits and you realize these traits because of this that this you're a different guy colonel ellis than you would have been had you not been captured I'm the same personality, I have the same values, but I have much more courage and strength of character about sticking with what I believe and drawing the line in the sand than I did. I was still kind of a young kid when I was captured, and I had all the right values and everything, but I didn't probably have the commitment behind it that as much as I thought I did. And in the end, you did. I guess you spent a lot of time just sitting, thinking, and wondering if this would be it, correct? Absolutely. But we also had great leadership. We always immediately would determine who the senior ranking officer was in the cell or in the camp or in the cell block. And that person was the leader, and they kind of set the tone and the pace and the culture. And that was so important to us. And we had some very courageous guys. So I had I had this, these role models to live up to. You know, I think you live up to or down to your role models. And we were fortunate to have some great role models, people that led with honor. And part of the reason for writing the book in the way that I did was to really honor that leadership. It turns out that courage and honor are two words that are very needed and relevant to our culture today. Right. I want to talk about this. And I also want to talk about the military, the looming $500 billion in cuts over the next 10 years, the cuts that have already taken place. And it's civilian now. Uh, mm -hmm. Back then, you were drafted. You signed up on your own. Yes. But you were drafted and you stayed in after. Yeah. I want to talk about our culture today. And, you know, one thing about this administration, I don't know if you're Democrat or Republican, I feel like there was much more respect for the, uh, for the military culture in the previous administration than this. I want to get your take on that and maybe take some calls. 1-866-408-7669. Colonel Lee Ellis is here. His book is Leading with Honor. Back with more right after this. It's Kilmeade and Friends on Fox News Talk.
Hey, welcome back to Kill Me to Friends. Uh, with me right now, Colonel Lee Ellis. He's talking about a brand new book, Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton, and what he's benefited from from that horrible time in his life. He was able to actually relay some information. He's now a, a much sought-after motivational speaker, and this book certainly sells uh, often, uh, early and often. Uh, Colonel, we talked a lot about those, some of the leadership principles. You talk about, number one, know yourself, guard your character, stay positive, confront your doubts and fears. Uh, we did not discuss that. How do you do that? Well, I think you have to decide what's the right thing to do, what's your duty, what's your responsibility, and then you lean into the pain and go do what you should do. Uh, that's what they should have done at Penn State. That's what there are a lot of situations in our culture today where leaders are trying to take the easy way out and dodge the bullet when they should be standing up and leaning into the pain of their fears and discomforts and taking on the tough issues. And I just think there's a, a comparison, apt comparison amongst presidents. For example, with this Benghazi situation, you have a president who was actually kept abreast of it while it was happening. For some reason, the help was not uh, was not. Uh, allowed to proceed or they decided not to have it proceed there was no interest in going to the by getting to the bottom of the investigation and there's been no interest in finding out who perpetrated that the the killing of four americans including an ambassador now contrast that with president kennedy president kennedy when he blew it with the bay of pigs our guys get captured the mission was a mess he had a listen i did it i blew it uh, i'm solely responsible big difference Yes. Well, I think it takes a lot of courage to do that. And he did write a book about courage, didn't he? Yeah. Profiles, Profiles and, courage. and courage. Right. That, that helps. Yeah. Uh, and the other lesson was uh, fight to win, for example. Yeah. It's really about being focused on your goals and not giving up easy. We had to fight every day. Was a, The battle was going on in those POW camps, and we had to fight to accomplish our goals. So uh, I think when you're committed to something, you have to fight to win. It doesn't mean you take advantage of other people and you know fight in that way, but it does mean that you're highly committed to seeing your goals through. You've got to believe you can succeed. Right, and finally, bounce back, be resilient. Expect to have some uh, setbacks. Absolutely. We're all going to have setbacks in life. The older you get, the more you realize that because you've gone through some. And so you look back and say, well, I made it through that time. I probably can make it through this time. And then you also look to examples of others who have set the example. We saw this this week, and uh, it was on carried on Fox News, in fact, where we had a senator who had a stroke. And now he, his, he set a plan, he set a goal, and he bounced back, and he walked up the steps of the Capitol yesterday. Yeah, and the senator said there's 40 steps to get there, and that was my goal, get exactly. to those 40 steps. That's how, you back, bounce, that's how you bounce serving back. Serving as a junior senator in Illinois. Now, uh, here's Senator John McCain on something that you know like very few Americans know, and that is being captive, and you were tortured. No mm -hmm. doubt about yes. it. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of enhanced interrogation, that's what our CIA calls it. They believe they got great information from the Al-Qaeda's worst of the worst from enhanced interrogation. O.J. Rodriguez of the CIA got it from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Abu Zubaydah. He witnessed it through waterboarding. Senator McCain is, says it never works. You, you uh, were in captivity with him. He also said this movie Zero Dark Thirty shows it works and it's inaccurate and I want to find out who told the movie makers that's the way it happened. Here he is. I watched this film and it shows a very brutal interrogation tactics being used by the CIA interrogator. It also shows extensive waterboarding of the, the people that they are holding and you, the clearly the information is that this waterboarding and torture uh, was uh, uh, the major factor in obtaining information about the whereabouts of bin Laden, specifically a courier that had been working for bin Laden. The fact is that no information, according to former CIA Director Leon Panetta, no information that was useful to them in tracking down bin Laden was a result of torture. Uh, I, the, the facts, according to the CIA, differ from that. Do you agree with John McCain? Well, I haven't seen the movie, and I don't know all the details on, on that situation. I will just say this. I do see that there is a place for uh, enhanced interrogations, and I would approve them if I thought there was going to be a bomb set off in New York City where we are here, and I felt like I could get information on it, I would use an enhanced interrogation. To me, there's a difference. Most all the torture in, in, in the Vietnam era was to get us to do something that was a lie, to make propaganda, to make anti-war propaganda for the enemy. 
that's torturing people to get a lie. And so we were able to kind of work our way around that. On the other hand, when you're torturing somebody for truth, to get the truth out of them that's going to save millions of lives, to me that's a different issue. Interesting. I never heard it put that way because uh, you're saying that they didn't want information about the next bombing. They knew you were... Uh, well, they, they did, did if they could get – in that case, they did, and and you kind of understand that. But, of course, we didn't know what the bombing was going to be the next day or the next hour because we were only briefed on our mission just prior to takeoff. So we didn't have that information. But they tried to get it from the guys they could get to right away, right after they were captured. But almost all the torture in our was, – was strictly to get us to collaborate with the enemy. Yeah, okay, so he in, was, in the summer right. of 19, let me just give you an example. In the summer of 1969, they were going through my camp. There was 55 guys at a camp called Sante, and they tortured over half the guys in that camp that summer. Uh, fortunately, I was a junior guy, and they hadn't gotten to me yet when they quit. But to sign a statement saying that they had received good treatment while they were POWs. Can you imagine torturing somebody to sign a statement saying they would received good treatment? It's amazing. Uh, it's unbelievable. You know what also is amazing? Have you been back to the Hanoi Hilton? I have not. Uh, a lot of the guys have been back to Vietnam, and some have been to the old Hanoi Hilton, and they've made a, a real propaganda show place out of that now also. Uh, why wouldn't you go? Uh, I would go. I've just been a workaholic and been busy. I've started right. two, started two companies since I retired and written three books, so I've just been a busy guy. Are you a guy that experienced PTSD? You know, I didn't know that I did for many, many years, but uh, finally I realized my wife kept telling me that I hadn't fully dealt with the loss, that I emotionally I was shut down for a long, long time. And I think that happens to men anyway, but especially if your personality kind of oriented towards not being emotional. And secondly, you've been trained in the military. And third, you've been a prisoner of war. You learn to shut down your emotions because you don't want to get too high and too optimistic and you don't want to get depressed. So you just kind of flatten out. And that's what I did. How, okay. I also didn't fully deal with my anger and uh, come to grips with that. I think those are the two main things, the loss of five and a half years and then dealing with the anger that was kind of built up uh, probably there. What's the first thing you did when you got out? The first thing I did, well, we all went to the cafeteria in the hospital, and we ate that meal we'd been thinking about, which was for the first year or two in the wintertime, every morning I would wake up dreaming about breakfast. And I was going through a cafeteria with a tray getting eggs and sausage and bacon and ham and grits and potatoes and all that. My first meal was a huge meal, and then went back and got a steak and some more eggs, and then went back and got ice cream and pie, and it was all easy. And you still remember. It was great, it, It's man. about it the great. Food. Well, you're great, and thanks so much for your service to the country and sharing what you learned during that horrific time in your life and all you've given. Leading with Honor is the name of the book. Go out and get it. Colonel Lee Ellis, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you, Brian. And thanks so much for listening to Kill Me to Friends. <laughs>